I'm so glad to be back with you guys today. And my voice is sounding a little bit better, so I'm super pumped about that. Um, I've had a great week with you guys, and um, I've enjoyed getting to speak in in your chapels and getting to meet some of you, and honestly getting to see random people that I've known from past seasons. Nathan Finn was my seminary professor, and Webb Drake was my college professor. He taught me speech, so I guess they'll send me my final grade later. So I'm waiting to see how I did, but... um, Like I said, I'm excited to be back with you guys because we have to finish the story, right? So all week as I've been with you guys, we, we started in Genesis, right? Um, we started in Genesis, and go, you can go ahead and go to the first slide, or I guess it would be the second slide, because today we're going to talk about the mandate and the story's end. But obviously, we have to rewind a little bit and remember where we've been, okay? So on Monday morning, we started in Genesis with the understanding that when God created um, people, he created them with a purpose, and he said, be fruitful and multiply and... Guys, come on. Be fruitful and multiply and... That's right. And so that was part of the purpose from the beginning. And if you remember, he was literally saying it to image bearers, to people that imaged him. And so this idea of like fill the earth with God's image has been present since the beginning. Well, we know that the enemy came into the garden and he manipulated them and he tricked them into putting, honestly, their own image on the throne instead of God's image. And through that, they became broken image bearers. They became broken image bearers, and God sent them out of the garden. He released them from having access to the tree of life, because if they had eaten from the tree of life, at that point, what would have happened? Guys, there's like thousands of you in here. Somebody should know the answer to that. Right, they would have lived forever in a sinful state, in a broken imaged state, which means they wouldn't have been able to be in a peaceful Sabbath relationship with God. That's pretty tragic. And so God sent them out of the garden and he, he put a cherubim there so they couldn't have access to the tree of life. Now, when they come out of the garden, um, as them as broken image bearers are filling the earth, what else is filling the earth alongside them? Violence and sin. This is not good, right? And so God comes and he, he sends a flood to wipe out the evil of the earth. And yet he chooses a man who is blameless and righteous, right? And his name was Noah. And when Noah got off the ark after the flood, um, God again spoke to humanity and he said, be fruitful, multiply, and who was it that was so loud? I see you. I see you. Right? He said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Well, at this point, what God does is right after this, he chooses a man, and that man's name was Abram. We primarily know him as Abraham. And what he did is he made a promise to Abraham, and he said that he was going to be in a covenant relationship with Abraham. And part of that covenant was that he was going to be with Abraham, and he was going to place his presence in the midst of Abraham and his descendants. And as part of this, what he says is, in you all of the families of the earth will be blessed. All of the families of the earth. This is the nations. So God's heart for the nations has been present since the beginning. So then if you came on Monday night, we picked up the story with Genesis 12, and we followed the storyline as God literally made his presence available and put his presence in the midst of a sinful people. But that's kind of tricky, right? Because they are sinners, And it's not about God's inability to be in the presence of sin. Whose inability is it about? Ours. It's about man's inability to be in the presence of God because they are sinners. And so God has to do things to enable them to be able to come into God's presence. And he does that through the law. He does that through a bunch of really awesome stuff. And he gives even visual representations of his presence through fire and other things. So like the bush that is on fire, but it's not burning, right? And then you've got the cloud and the pillar, and these things um, are how God puts his presence in the midst. Ultimately, through the Ark of the Covenant, which gets put into the tabernacle and then into the temple, and this is how people come into the presence of God. I know I'm going super fast, but it's just how we gotta be, you know? 
So if you came last night, we started in Leviticus. Because Leviticus is awesome. <laughs> and we looked at how um, Leviticus and the law is, is, is where God would give people the key to be able to come into his presence and interact with him. And then I shared some stories with you of restored image bearers, one in scripture and one in my own personal life. Now, as the Old Testament continued on, you know, we get into kingdoms and we get into wars, and I wish we had time to go into all of those details, but if I stop there, we won't get to Jesus. So I feel like that's a pretty important part, right? So that's where we're going to pick up today. Towards the end of the Old Testament, there were prophecies that were being made saying, Jesus is coming. The Messiah is coming. A better presence is coming. And this was a promise not just for the people of Israel, but it was a promise for the nations. And that's seen, again, all through the Old Testament, because even when God was putting his presence in the midst of the people of Israel, did the nations get to be a part of that? Yes. Over and over, God would say, be holy in the sight of the people. And then we even looked at specific non-Israelites who were able to join into the family of God. I don't know how to, I don't know how to like, make it any clearer to you guys that God loves people of all nations. Because his story makes it real obvious. So then Jesus is born. <clears throat> Jesus is born. And, you know, I, um, I was talking to Crystalline uh, on Monday. And because um, I was honestly kind of feeling a little guilty because we're going to go through Jesus' story super quick. And, um, and she was like, no, they hear a lot about Jesus. So I want you to understand that when I go through his story really quick, it's not because I don't think he's important. He is the climax of the story. But I think you guys hear a lot about the climax of the story, and I want to make sure we finish the story today, okay? So what I'm going to do is point a few things out. Number one, did you know that God made an announcement that Jesus was born to the nations? Did you guys know that? When Jesus was born... What, what did he do to tell people he was there? Do you guys remember? There was a star and there was also the shepherds, right? So the angels came to the shepherds. Now the shepherds were the people of Israel. So that was for the Israelites. Who was the star for? It was for the nations. <clears throat> did you know that as part of the law, the people of Israel weren't really supposed to pay close attention to the stars? They weren't really supposed to map the stars. So why would God send a star as an announcement? Because he wasn't just sending Jesus for the Jews, he was sending Jesus for the nations. And so the wise men from afar, from other nations, they see the star and they come. So let's, let's just point out a few things about Jesus. Well, Jesus is the image of God, okay? Colossians 1, 15 through 20 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Now let's think about this. The fullness of God. Did God dwell in the Old Testament? Yes, that was like the plot of the Old Testament, God dwelling with his people. But there was still a separation. There was still something that was more coming. And that is because Jesus comes and he is the fullness of God, pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Okay, something else about Jesus. He is presence dwelling in the midst. Remember, when, when God in the Old Testament came and he dwelled with his people, he wasn't on the sidelines and their camp was over there. Where did he put his presence? In the middle, in the middle of the people of Israel. So when Jesus comes, does he isolate himself? Does he stand on a stage and never let anyone get close to him? No, he's literally dwelling in the midst of people. He's hanging out with them. He's having dinner with them. He's letting little kids sit on his lap. He is in the midst. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the word that is used there is the Greek equivalent for tabernacle. Did you guys know that? What, what's, why does that matter? What's the important thing about the tabernacle? What? The presence of God dwells in the tabernacle. And so if you're saying the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, you are saying that Jesus 
is the tabernacle. He is the presence of God. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And, and this is not the only place where this is clear. I mean, at one point, and I talked about this a little bit last night, but at one point, Jesus literally says, something greater than the temple is here. And again, as we talked about, that's not primarily a poetic thing Jesus is saying. Like, sure, he's poetic. We can write songs about this. But like, he's making a theological statement. And they would have known in that context what it means for him to say something greater than the temple is here. Because there's only one thing that could be greater than the temple. And what would that be? God's presence without separation. And so he's either crazy or he's God. Like those are the two options for who Jesus is. So he's the image of God. He's presence dwelling in the midst. And he's gathering all kinds of people to himself. It doesn't matter if you have lived a perfect life. It doesn't matter if other people like you. Um, He he gathered um, the worst people. He gathered the tax collectors. He hung out with prostitutes. He hung out with people from other nations. And he gathered them to himself, just like in the Old Testament, how God, by dwelling in the midst of the people of Israel, gathered the nations to himself. Do you guys see how this is continuing? Isn't the story better when you understand the first part of it? He's restoring image bearers. He's restoring image bearers. Now, ultimately, what is the biggest way that God restores image bearers? This is not hard. Yes, through Jesus. And what is the biggest way that Jesus restores image bearers? His sacrifice. I see you. Good job. That wasn't a trick question, guys. Y'all should know that answer. If not, we can pause and we can just talk about that. Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, and then he died on a cross. But guys, he didn't just die on a cross, he rose again. That's like super important. You guys know that, right? Like I've heard people tell the gospel and they forget the resurrection. And I've had people, especially to my friends in Southeast Asia, we've had people come from America and and get to share Jesus with them. And I I promise you, one time I remember sitting there and this girl was so excited about Jesus and she's telling my friend about Jesus and she goes, and he died for you. And she just stopped. And I was like, maybe she's pausing for like dramatic effect, right? And like, I'm just kind of sitting there and, and my friend is like, okay. And then it suddenly dawned on her and she's like, and he rose again. And my friend was like, because guys, everybody dies, but only Jesus rose again. And he shows that he took the biggest effect of the fall and he just flipped it over. He's like, oh, that's got nothing on me because I'm God. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Now, there's kind of two parts to this. There's the like first salvific part where you become a follower of Jesus and he calls you holy. He restores your image. But then, guys, it's, I don't know, it should be super clear to those of you who are followers of Jesus that he continues to conform you to the image of his son. Like, I've been a follower of Jesus since I was in third grade, and I'm almost 40. And let me tell you, he is working hard on me because he is still conforming me to the image, and that's what we call sanctification. So he's working hard to make me look like him. He's restoring me as an image bearer. And one day I cannot wait to image him perfectly, but that's not going to be till new creation. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And then he sent out image bearers. 
So when Jesus was on the earth, he chose some followers, um, 12 guys, right? And then there were actually bigger crowds around them and they would follow Jesus and they would listen to his teaching and he would show them examples of what it looks like to live a life that glorifies God. And he was making them into disciples. He was making them into image bearers and showing them that he was God. And after he died and rose again, he came back and he sends them out. And actually he was sending them out even before he was like giving them little practices, you know. Um, but when he left, he said, okay, I'm leaving, but I'm going to leave you with the helper. And what he did is he told them the next part of the story. He gave them the plot line for the next part of the story. And so he said to them in Matthew 28, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of who? All. all nations. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. What, guys, isn't that just another way to say? Fill the earth. Fill the earth with God's image. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And I love what Jesus does because he's like, Go make disciples, but then he defines what that means. Okay, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So that's salvific. You've got to align yourself with Christ first to become a disciple. And then he says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So that's kind of the discipleship process that many of us are familiar with. I want to know what this book says about God and about how I should live my life. And then he says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Wait a second. You mean the story is still about his presence? Yeah. Because God sends them out with a purpose, but he says, you're not going by yourself. I'm going to give you a helper. And so once again, we, I just sit in like acknowledgement that the mandate at the very beginning of the story of the Bible to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, fill the earth is now being given in a different type of way. You can go to the next screen where Jesus says, make disciples of all nations. It's so important that you guys see this thread and you see this purpose because the next part of the story, if you were to structure the Bible into like acts of a play, the next part of the story is actually the part that we are present in. And so let's, let's look at that part of the story. Acts, everybody turn to Acts if you have your Bibles. So in Acts, it says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do. What does it mean when Jesus begins to do something? Begins, wow. Begins to do something. It means it's not done, right? Is it not done because he couldn't finish it and he got tired? No, it's not done because he's inviting you to be a part of his story. He's inviting you to be a part of his story. And Acts 1.8 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So here he's talking to his apostles, okay? And if you were going to summarize this part of the story and the plot line, this verse is kind of the summary. So the first part where it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, that happens in Acts 2. And then you continue on. It says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea. Well, sorry, first just in Jerusalem. That happens in Acts 3 through 5. And then you get into all Judea and Samaria. That's Acts 6 through 9. And then to the ends of the earth is started in Acts 10 through 20. So if to the ends of the earth is started, where do you guys think we fit? We fit in the to the ends of the earth part of the story. That's where we fit. In Acts 2, 
It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, there were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire. Where have we seen fire before? Burning bush, where else? Pillar of fire, where else? Did you know when the tabernacle was built and dedicated, fire came down from heaven and filled the tabernacle with the glory of God? Did you know that when the temple was built, fire came down and filled the temple with the glory of God? So what do you think it means now when these men are sitting around in this upper room and tongues of fire come down and rest on their heads? What do you think that means? The presence of God is there, and it is now filling his temples. We now, if you are a follower of Jesus, you can have the presence of God dwelling inside of you. That's why you're called the temple. That's why you're like a tabernacle, which is really cool to think about. So divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? And then it literally lists out all these different nations. And Peter gets up and he gives this sermon, and it says that at the end of this sermon, over 3,000 people come to be followers of Jesus. Do you think it is coincidence that God sends the Holy Spirit and then that right away who he's preaching to are the nations? Is that coincidence or is that part of the story? That's part of the story. What? How are some of us missing this? And then right after this, after they become followers of Jesus, if you look at the end of Acts 2, in chapter, I mean, in verse 42, it talks about how at that point, all those people who have become followers of Jesus, they devoted themselves to teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread. Um, and, and they're doing all of these wonders and signs as they invite other people to join their community. So this group of people, these new followers of Jesus, they are gathered to the presence of God, they are gathered to teaching, and they are gathered to each other to become disciples and bear God's image. And guys, part of bearing God's image is de desiring for others to know him. If you are a disciple but you're not making disciples, you're not really a disciple. And if you're a disciple, but you don't have a heart for the nations, you're not really a disciple. And that can be expressed in many ways, but do not miss this. Do not waste the story that God wants to write in your life. And so if we were to look at that structure again on the next slide, I want you to see this. On the next slide... There it is. So when you're looking at that summarized plot line, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and then let's put in there at the end of Acts 2, the fellowship of believers and becoming disciples. So there's a process here, okay? And guys, the reason I want to point this out is because many of you are in that red boxed part of your walk with Jesus. You are here in a place where you have followers of Jesus investing in you, teaching you, discipling you, you're becoming disciples, God is bearing your image, I mean, not your image, you are bearing God's image, let's rewind that, pretend I never said it, okay? Um, you are bearing God's image, but guys, don't get stuck only in fellowship with each other. Don't get stuck in fellowship with each other, because you should be inviting others into the fellowship, Because when you look at the story, again, I'm going to put that storyline graphic on the screen for you. 
<clears throat> when you look at the storyline, I want you to look at the movement of what is happening here in the plot line. Do you remember at the beginning of the week, um, I talked about stories a little bit, and I said, every story has a major character, right? And the major character of this story is God. Everybody else is a minor character. That includes you. That includes you. One time I was reading a book that a cinematography uh, student gave me. It was about story. And it was a professor writing to his students, and it was how to write a good screenplay and how to write a good story. And he wasn't talking about the Bible, but it blew me away because he made this statement in there to these students. He said, every subplot you write should point to the larger plot line. Every subplot you write should live out the larger plot line. And every minor character you write should point to the major character. And he made this really dramatic statement. He's like, if your subplot doesn't point to the big plot, take it out. It's not important. Now, again, he wasn't writing about the Bible, okay? <laughs> but I was reading that, and I was so convicted because I'm like, do I think of my life like this? Do I constantly ask the question, how does my subplot live out the main plot line of God's plot in scripture? Do I know how it does that? Do I wake up daily knowing that I am a minor character and never meant to be the hero? Do I understand where I fall in the storyline? We are in the storyline where Jesus has said, make disciples of all nations, fill the earth. That's where we are. So you are in this story of God filling the earth. What role are you playing? So I want to I want to give you three considerations. I want to give you three considerations. Okay? What role are you playing? Here's your three options. Well, you're a broken image bearer being invited to be restored by Christ. So I'm not going to assume that everyone in here is a follower of Jesus. And so for a minute, I wanna to speak to those of you who are not yet followers of Jesus. You know deep inside of you that something is wrong with your image bearing. You're young, you probably have a lot of life to live. Don't waste your time trying to restore your own image. It won't work. Don't try and be the hero of your story, it won't work. God is giving you an invitation to be restored through his son, through Jesus. And if I'm speaking to you, I promise you there are people in this room that would love to talk to you. If you are one of those people that would love to talk to anyone, raise your hand. Look around if it's you. There are people, some of them are staff, faculty, some of them are students. Just talk to someone about it. The second option you have is you've accepted that Christ restores your image salvifically and are being invited by God to bear his image in your life. And this is what I mean by that. I think there are a lot of, of people who have accepted Jesus as the God of their salvation, but they have not yet let him be the Lord of their life. Those should come hand in hand, but they don't always for people. And if that's you, there are people in this room who would love to disciple you, who would love to be accountable with you. Some of them are your peers who are like, hey, I'm figuring it out too. And God is doing kind things in my broken image bearing. But if you are the person that you have thought, man, I've got it. It's a one and done. My salvation is good. You're actually missing out on a lot by not letting him be the Lord of your life as well. So... If you are someone in this room that would be willing to talk to someone about this, raise your hand. If this is you, look around. And then the third option, you are seeking to bear God's image and God is inviting you to fill the earth by making disciples of all nations. Those are your three options. This is how you are in this story. Now, let me say something. When Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, he wasn't standing in America. He wasn't looking out at every other nation. I know that. Jesus, where is he from? Heaven. Jesus is from heaven. He was born in Israel, that's right. 
Y'all are good there. Um, so when, when Jesus is talking about all the nations, he's including America, okay? He is including America, but he's also not just talking about America. And here's the reality of America. People in America have easy access to the gospel. And people around the world don't. And God might be speaking to some of you and saying, no, I want you to stay and I want you to make disciples here in the nations, whether that's in your work or in your dorm or in your family or people that you meet um, in line at Walmart or, or wherever it is you guys shop. That is what some of you are called to do. But some of you are called to leave this place and go to the nations. And he is worthy for that. Don't miss it. Look at these questions. Where are you at and how are you responding? Because the storyline is continuing. It's not done. One day the story will end. God will send Jesus back. Jesus will come back. He will defeat the enemy. Anybody excited about that? <laughs> right? I'm, I am very excited about that. Jesus is going to defeat the enemy. And then people who know Jesus and have acknowledged him as their savior are going to be invited into an eternity. And it is very clear from the way the story ends that the nations are a part of this. So let's look at Revelation 7, 9. After this I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. You can go to the next screen. Standing before the throne and before the lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Standing before the throne. Some of you, after my story last night, you asked if, um, if how my friend is doing, how Elle is doing. I haven't talked to her in many, many years. We don't have access to each other because when I was serving overseas, social media wasn't really a thing. So we don't really have access to each other. But when I read this passage, I just think about the fact that one day I'm gonna get to have a reunion with my friend in front of the throne. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you will be there too. But this is what I would say to you. Who are you bringing with you? Don't come alone. Who are you bringing with you? I want to end by reading Revelation 21, 22. This is the end of the story. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Why is it holy? God's presence, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. By the way, that's the same wording that God told the Israelites before they left Egypt. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Guys, that's like the most summarized meta-narrative story right there. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Why is there no payment? Jesus paid it. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Sometimes we don't like to read this part of the passage because it seems negative, but let's shift our perspective a little bit. Look at God's kindness. One day, when we are in new creation, sin will not be allowed in. Hurt will not be allowed in. 
Broken things will not be allowed in. And I saw no temple in the city, I'm skipping down to 22, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb, and the city has no need of sun for, or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations." But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city also, on either side of the river, the tree of life. In other words, we have access to the tree of life again. Because in new creation, as restored image bearers, if we eat from the tree of life, and we live forever, what does that mean? Forever we're in a Sabbath, peaceful relationship with God, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face. In the Old Testament, there was a curtain in the middle of God's presence and the people. Because as broken image bearers, if they were to come into the presence of God, it would have been dangerous for them. But in new creation, as restored image bearers, we will see his face and his name will be on our foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. So let's put that last slide up. And I'm going to ask you guys one question, and then I'm going to pray, and Alan will come up. But here's my question. In this story, how are you a part of God filling the earth? It is a simple question. And it's the plot line God is weaving in his story. Dear Jesus, just thank you for your story, and I thank you that you have a heart for all peoples, because I am not an Israelite. <laughs> And so you had a heart for me to know you, and you have a heart for the people in this room to know you, but you also have a heart for people outside of this room and outside of this country to know you. God, I pray that one day when we are all together again in front of your throne, I pray that we bring the nations with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, would you join me in thanking Kesset? What a great job. Thank you so much. One quick thing, I know you're leaving. I'm just, the invitation was clear. I'm not going to extend that. Please, if God's spoken to you, would you come see us in the Institute for Global Leadership, Craft Hemp Hill. Let us help you flesh out this invitation that you've heard. Have a great rest of the day.